Yeah, um, my my first worry is when you get a snake and you and you put it in that bag, it's still alive or you kill it. No, it's still alive in the it's bag. Still alive. Uh huh. Um, how long can that snake be in that bag? Because if you close it, then yeah. you you won't have the possibility of feeding the snake. A feeding, yeah. So normally, that's a good question. So it just it gets also to in more generally how long we keep the animal in a bag. Right, and that's the same for our reptiles and our lizards, for our, our lizards, our snakes, our frogs. And so normally, we process everything the following day. So we're normally doing this work at night. We catch the animals and in the morning, we begin preparing specimens, right? And so the snakes, are, snakes and amphibians are usually just fine during that. We may in the morning open up the bags and put in some fresh air and tie it again. Um, but their metabolism is generally low enough that they're fine inside the bags, yeah. So after that, you release the snake or you well, we'll, collect specimen? Yeah, so we'll collect the specimen. So once it's in the bag, if we're going to prepare it the next day, mm -hmm. we'll euthanize it. So we'll kill the snake. And then once it's dead, we'll start you know, doing other work with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a good question. So normally, we process all our specimens you know, within 12 to 16 hours for the most part. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. I was really impressed on um, your presentations. But I have a quick question as uh, snakes and uh, other amphibian, as some uh, poisonous, others uh, venomous. So I don't know what are the necessary measures that you take uh, when you, uh, you go for an expedition to avoid an uh, incident. Right, so for, for frogs, um, there are toxic frogs. We don't have any toxic frogs in Africa, or do you have any in Southeast Asia? I don't think there are any truly toxic frogs, like dart frogs. Yeah, so where we work um, for taking precautions for frogs is really not a ne necessary. But for you know, dealing with venomous snakes, our main precautions, like I've said, are that you know, we generally never handle the snakes. Um, unless we know, you know definitively that it's a non-venomous snake. And we, I mean, we really take a lot of precautions to have you know, people that are experienced to work with snakes be the ones that are actually handling them if we have to. Yep. In general, a lot of snakes won't attack you unless you start handling them, right? Uh, and so most snakes are as, as afraid or more afraid of you than you are of them. And so, you know, once we start manipulating them, then that's when they may be angry and want to strike. And so that's why we, you know, take a lot of precautions that if we grab them with tongs, we have a good hold of them, we put them inside a bag where we can see them, uh, and it's thick enough plastic that in general they, they never strike or actually bite through the plastic. And so, you know, it, it's contained once it's in that. Would you agree with that, Rafe? More or less, yeah. Sure. Let me come to you. Oh, well, here I'll stop at Caleb on the way. Uh, I wanted to find out how you collect conrawas. Conrawas? Yeah. Oh, conrawas are hard to catch. Yeah. So, um, the sm which size? That's the catch. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so Caleb is asking about a, a genus of frog that's widespread across Africa. It occurs in the Ethiopian mountains. Uh, there's this, actually it turns out there's two species in the Ethiopian mountains um, and there's a few in West Africa and then within Cameroon we have the largest frog in the world is Kinrawa goliath. It, uh, from its nose to its, uh, its butt, it's about this long. It's stretched out, it can be about this long. They're very large, they're eaten. Uh, that species is the only protected species in Cameroon of a frog. And so they are difficult to catch. Um, you can use nets to drag them in and catch them. Um, they have very powerful legs, so if they're in the water, they can be gone. You can succeed in sneaking up on them um, in the water, but you know, it's pretty hard. Um, and so normally it's some combination of nets and teamwork that result in catching the, at least the larger ones. The crassipes, the smaller ones, we can catch by hand or net sometimes, but even them, once they're in the water, they can disappear very quickly, right? Yeah. And then we have the slippery, the total slippery. Yeah. Very They're hard to catch. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of aquatic frogs, especially large aquatic frogs, have very powerful hind legs for swimming, and they can very quickly disappear into the water as soon as you try and catch them. Uh, so it's really some combination of stealth and teamwork that really results in catching most of those those frogs. In, in the case of like a publication, like if you do a mock recapture experiment or something, this, is it fine to report and say that well we. We had a good team and then we were able to pick up staff with our hands and nets and stuff. 
I don't know, do you have a standard way of, uh, because we pick them up with our hands with a lot of care and with yeah. some experience now. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's generally okay. fine because it's going to be difficult to catch those frogs in another way. Yeah, I think as long as you're handling them, you know, as gently as possible. Yeah. Um, I think once you have enough experience, you're not grabbing the frogs really tightly because I think people that are just beginning can sometimes hold frogs so tightly that they'll kill them. But unfortunately, there's not much of a better way to catch this canrao as at this point. I think there was a question here. Yeah. Uh, um, I have a small problem. I don't know what uh, method of sampling was employed if you want to do like uh, amphibians or let me say you have, for instance, you have worked in the jar reserve. Mm. So do you um, just go to a do you do uh, purposive sampling or what kind of sampling method is being used? Yep. So normally the type of surveys that we'll do is we'll go out at night and walk um, paths or transects in the forest looking for frogs. The, the catch is that in many of these, if we really want to know what species are there, we have to use a lot of different techniques, right? So I mean, we're not only using, you know, and for us, we're not really using visual surveys or call surveys. I mean, you can, you can hear what species are present by listening, but in a lot of cases, the diversity is so poorly known that we don't know what calls go with what species. And so it's really necessary for us to go out on you know, forest paths at night and walk those paths and catch individuals as we're going along those paths. Does that answer your question so or do you have more no, specific? There's no particular method of sampling. It's just like some kind of randomly just move around. Well, I mean, it's a combination, right? So we can have uh, sampling events where we're focusing on a particular habitat at night that, you know, for we know however many man hours we're putting into it that we can afford that night. I mean, we can do time sampling events if we're really interested in knowing, you know, the, the amount of time, the, the amount of species that we can recover in a very specific time interval. Uh, but for a lot of these, what we're trying to do is just simply find every individual that we can. Uh, so, I mean, Rafe, do you want to say anything more about that? I probably have to come to you. Yeah, no, I really agree. I think that, that for trying to record every species that's there, you really have to free yourself up from these standardized methods like pitfalls and drift fences. Because as Dave mentioned, you'll never catch a Sicilian in a, well, you might catch one if you're lucky in a, in a pitfall trap. But you have to be very lucky to catch some of these very rare animals that have very specific microhabitat. And so if you can free yourself up from that and search all the habitats by hand manually, um, then you can, if we record the amount of time that we put into the search efforts every day, if we record the number of people that are working together, then at least you could say every day for, for two weeks we had four people searching for five hours a day. And we could say I had 20 person hours per day. Yeah. And then you could use that as a standardized sampling effort if you did want to do statistical comparisons between sites. That's the way I try to do it. So. But, it's, but it's difficult to you know, have a single method and rely on a single method through time repeatedly and use that at every site, but simply because the microhabitats vary between sites. I mean, you may end up you know, at a place that has no streams and no good mud, so there's really no reason to dig for Sicilians. Uh, so employing you know, like the, same, the exact same set of things at every single field site sometimes isn't really applicable. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah? Okay, when you are in very remote places and especially deep into the forest, do you carry any anti venoms in case, just in case? Do we have any anti venoms? Yeah. I typically don't carry any anti venoms. Do you, Rafe? I don't. A lot of the, a lot of the, the effective anti venoms, the ones that are actually do work, are usually developed for specific species. So there's only you know, one antivenom that will work for this species of cobra, and there's a completely different set of antivenom proteins that will work for this other species of cobra. So you'd have to have a very specific, correct one work with each species of the lacquer, for example. Yeah. And they have to be refrigerated. And they're very, very expensive. expensive. There are some newer methods that are being used that are different than antivenoms, potentially, that are being developed, um, especially like for lapids, right? Um, that hopefully will sort of come online and be more largely, you know, available to people. But then, even then, they're still developed for, you know, particular types of venom. Right. Yeah, it's a good question.
Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, mainly concerned about the system. Uh, we say it's not well distributed and you can't get it by just any method, you have to dig. Is there a kind of a sign that you detect that in this area there could be sin and then you dig or you just dig upwards <laughs> So that's a good question. Um, for many years, I would uh, ask one of the leading Sicilian biologists how he found Sicilians, and he always told me he just dug. But then when I, when I really understood, it, well, he didn't dig anywhere. He only dug in the spots he knew he'd find Sicilians. So um, yes, there are very specific, depending on the types of Sicilians, specific habitat types. Um, in Cameroon, what we'll be looking for is sites that are relatively near streams where the soil is not too wet and it's not too hard. It has to be just right uh, and that's pretty difficult. Yeah, town? Are you, have you dug enough in other conditions that you're sure that there are not other Sicilians there? No, I haven't, yeah. Um, it's, it's also partly, you know, it's the easiest place in some cases to find them, right? So it's kind of like um, there's salamanders in the United States that we know occur everywhere, but the place that's most reliable to find their eggs is in a very particular type of forest where we can tear apart the logs easily. In the rest of the type of forest, the logs are so hard that we, we can't open them. But if we're looking for eggs of this type of salamander, we generally find them in hemlock forest because the hemlock logs are really easy for us to tell apart, take apart. But we know that they're everywhere else and they must have eggs, but we can't find them, right? So it's like that for Sicilians in some cases where you know, there are particular habitats that are probably easier to sample in some ways. Um, in other parts of the world you know, where they have aquatic Sicilians, you can find them in rice farms and things like that. Uh, and so in Cameroon, they're terrestrial. And you may find them near the surface in some species if it's really wet out, uh, especially if the ground becomes really saturated with water. They may move up to the surface, right? Uh, but, you know, when it's not, you know, pouring rain out, a lot of times we're going to have to dig for them. Yeah. And obviously, there's some soil types that are just almost impossible to dig in, right? So, yeah. Probably impossible for Sicilians to dig in. Right, well. presumably. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sis here. Well, I have another challenge with the tadpoles. Because mm. um, herpetologists draw out tadpoles out of the water for research and so on. So to me, so far, they look the same. I don't know whether <laughs> the tadpoles are different uh, frogs and uh, whatever look I mean, there's a way of tearing them apart yep. by me looking at them. Yeah, so tadpoles are, can be remarkably difficult to identify. Uh, in many museum collections, we have tadpoles that at this point, you know, for instance, we have older collections of tadpoles from Cameroon that were generated in the 1960s, up even through the 1990s, that in many cases, the best that we'll really be able to do is to identify them to genus. Uh, so different genera, often have very different tadpole types and we can identify those in the field. We do have some field guides that have just been developed for African tadpoles, but identifying species by tadpoles can be more difficult because some of the traits um, that we would look at for tadpoles, they vary among and within species. So there's overlapping patterns of variation so it can become difficult to really discern which species you're looking at. Um, what we use a lot of times, and you'll see us do in the field, is that we not only tissue, take tissue samples of the adults, but we also take tissue samples of representative tadpoles from you know, a particular locality. We'll sample, you know, in, in a particular snag in a stream, you may have leaf litter uh, stuck on a, 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 you know, a small log in a stream. And if you dig a net around in there, you may find four very different looking types of tadpoles. And that's common here in the mountains of Cameroon. And so the question is, what are those? And so what we'll do is we'll usually take a tissue sample of a representative of each type of tadpole. We'll tissue sample it, and then we can, using sequence data, match it up with what the adults look like. And then for many, many species, even in Cameroon, we're interested in that because we actually don't know in some cases what the life history of the frogs are. There's a genus of toad in Cameroon, for instance, that we're still uncertain if it has a tadpole or not. We just don't know that very, very basic thing about its biology. And so the more that we go out and are sampling tadpoles, sometimes we find tadpoles that we don't know what species it is. There's cases in which we have sampled a species at a locality only by the tadpoles. We, hadn't, we didn't catch any of the adults, right? Have you had that experience? Yeah. So, you know, for instance, on Mount Mananguba here, the only time I've ever caught Cardioglossa trifasciata was as a tadpole. 
And we know that because other investigators have found adults that they had referenced uh, genetic material for, and we can match up the tadpoles to the adults. Yep. But it can, it can be pretty difficult. So the way that we, we use now is we use the uh, genetic data to help us sort of figure that out. Yep.